So I was playing baritone, um, and it came time to, I never knew how to play the thing. I never bothered to learn, but it came time to, for the final. So the teacher was like, all right, here's your music, play the song. So I was like, okay, well, I had this little trick on my, my baritone that I just, I would, the keys would stick and I knew it. So I smacked him down before he called me and I was like, oh, my horn's broke. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't do the thing. He's like, well, just put, pick your mouthpiece out and borrow his. And I wasn't expecting that. So I grabbed it, right? And I'm sitting there looking at him and I go, can I play drums? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Room 6, the channel dedicated to the local Las Vegas music scene and the people that make it, including me and these guys. I'm Josh, and today my guests are self-described alternative sound makers uh, who also dabble in a little experimental rock. Combining the sensibilities of punk rock with the unpredictability of experimentation, their latest EP, Playlist for Purgatory, showcases their diverse musical influences, while the artwork gives a glimpse into their headspace. Sound fair? Yeah. Nice. Uh, the EP is actually a three-parter, with more coming soon. Uh, the first one drops... when? Two weeks. Two weeks at time of recording. You can find, <laughs> uh, you can find links down below. June 27th. Yep. You can find links down below. In the meantime, please welcome to the channel, Wyatt in the Ashes. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, got a nice enough to bring me... where is it? A pin? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, put a, I'll put a picture up. Uh, and this is an example of the artwork. Uh, the urn theme, and we'll get into that a little bit. But first off, go ahead and, if anybody's watching this, they don't know who you are, thanks for watching. Uh, tell them who you are and what you do in the band. Uh, my name is AJ. Uh, I play guitar and sing in Wyatt and the Ashes. Uh, I'm Dave, and I play drums. Yeah. In Wyatt and the Ashes. <laughs> Okay. You sure did. <laughs> Just make sure that that's why you're here, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, first off, five out of five stars on Facebook. Yeah. We got some uh, friends. Yeah, actually. <laughs> you, you, the, the reviews are real. I was impressed. Comparing your sound to everything from a gazelle mounting a giraffe at sunset on the Serengeti, <laughs> humping vigorously to riffs and melodic tones like Tiger Army, to uh, <laughs> add meaning to your life. Listen to Wide in the Ashes. I was like, I want reviews like that. Those are awesome. Well, we got a small following, but they're they're pretty pretty nice to yeah, us. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Um, now you also play in Jerk. Uh, I do. I play bass. Yeah. Um, for anybody who doesn't know Jerk, what would you describe? How would you? Describe? Uh, Ramones core punk rock, uh, melodic pop punk, um, just fun, fast, energetic type stuff. We keep it, you know, to the core. And you're going back on tour in September. Yeah, yeah, we do have a fall uh, tour. Right on. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been with them? Uh, about three months. New boy. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Yeah. Uh, well, I, do the, I do the easy part, so. Well, yeah. along with congratulations for the five out of five stars on Facebook. Happy early birthday. Oh, hey, thanks. No worries. Yeah. Um, before we get into other questions, I just wanted to say thank you very much for coming on. Um, if you want to be on the channel, hit me up in the, down the, uh, there's an email address down there in the description. Come on by. We'll have a good time. Uh, if you want, want to be reviewed. Great, I'll be happy to do it. If you want to look like me, I got some new merch out, room6.shop. I have a whole line of here, support a singer, support a drummer, support a bassist, support a, uh, what's the other one? It's guitarist. <laughs> Mandolinist. <laughs> yes, I don't have one yet for that, but I've got all new uh, merch designs at room6.shop. And uh, yeah, drop by, pick up some merch, show it off at the show. Are you still, the, doing the Wolfman thing? So uh, that was kind of my radio personality nickname. Uh, some of the guys in the band also started calling me Wolfman just because of the amount of hair and my knack for late night shenanigans <laughs> at times. You, but you, but I've settled down. You do bear a passing resemblance to Wolfman Jack. Yeah. Hey, I'll take it. Yeah. I'd probably put a picture up here again. <laughs> um, are you still doing the Honest Saloon podcast or is that... Uh, I'm on hiatus right now, kind of focusing on the music projects with Wyatt and the Ashes, uh, getting this released, um, you know, getting everything prepared for the, the future releases and trying to get a good couple shows booked here pretty soon. Uh, so kind of taking a break. Um, unfortunately, we had a 
you know, a very close friend that was owner and operator of the station here, Radio yep. Vegas dot rocks, uh, Jay Bird. Yep, Mr. Uh, Jay Bird. Rest in peace, uh, brother. Um, passed away, and he was kind of the motivating factor in in me getting involved with the station. Mm -hmm. uh, so things just didn't feel right for a minute. Uh, There's, you know, it just didn't feel right to jump back into it. Uh, and I felt like it was, it was time to take a, a moment away and yeah. just um, focus on the music for a while and, and mourn. Yeah, I, I know that uh, Jaber, his passing affected a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I know Waz had to step back and focus more on the Greasy Conversation thing. And, right. Um, I've, I've been on, I was on uh, his show a couple times, just me and my acoustic, um, trying to, to uh, you know, drum up interest in, in the band. And I, I remember... He was, he was always nice. He was always supportive. Yeah. And yeah. It turns out he was a friend of some friends of ours. I walk into their house one day. And he's sitting there. I'm like, where are my worlds combining? What, what yeah. Are you, what are you doing here? Yeah. I met a lot of great people through that uh, connection. Everyone was really supportive and really nice. Um, I think growing up here in Vegas and doing music for a long time, I always felt like there was a disconnect from a scene. And for a while there, even though it wasn't band related, it was just kind of entertainment in general. I kind of felt part of a of a family for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a real good sense of uh, family. You know, um, so that was the hardest thing to see. Kind of, you know, Jay really did a good job naturally of keeping everybody together in a sense uh, in that group, and it was just always a good time. And I learned I learned so much, honestly, in uh, just a short time. <laughs> that I was lucky enough to have a show on Radio Vegas Art Rocks. Uh, you know, it, it was a very positive experience in my life. Um, you know, it is unfortunate, but, you know, it's um, something I've, I've definitely grown from, and I always look at the positive aspects of it. So. Right on. Uh, we talked about your artwork a little bit. Now, is that your artwork? So, um, if you're talking about the album cover, the birds, just, yeah, everything on, uh, on the, um... so I, yeah, I, I did take that photograph, uh, the album cover of playlist for purgatory. It's the, uh, you know, dead bird, which we had no <laughs> part. We're, we're, we're very for animals. Uh, actually me and David are vegan and, uh, you know, I get a lot of questions like, Oh, did you kill that? And I'm like, no, it was dead. And ironically, someone had placed, it was, the bird had, uh, had died like by my house and then the neighbors moved out next door and someone had put a stuffed animal of another bird, uh, next to their house, almost like mimicking mm -hmm. that bird. And I was like, I gotta get this in a shot. <laughs> so I moved the stuffed animal over next to the actual bird and took a photograph and that's the the cover of the album that you've seen now for playlist. It is uh, awesome. Um, but I was actually talking about the artwork on, on the website. Okay. That's uh, still being developed, it looks like. Yeah, it's uh, Earn Industries is kind of an in-development uh, type thing. Yeah. Um, like, who did this? So I designed that. Okay. Um, basically just Photoshopped some stereo speakers into an urn and kind of traced it and illustrated it. And it was kind of simple. It was my take of... Uh, trying to achieve like a misfits fiend skull or uh right you know social distortion type iconic image i guess so right on um before i get over to you camera three wants to misbehave so i'm going to try sticks and that quick okay. break so dave yeah you built custom drums i built Oh, built. A custom drum set. Ah, I see. <laughs> I would love to. Learned your lesson? Yeah, no. I mean, I'd love to. I did it just kind of on a whim and with very minimal tools needed, <laughs> but I got it done. So, right on. Yeah. Um, so you had no experience. You just said, I'm going to build a drum set. Well, I'm a carpenter by trade. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I, I don't, I'm not a wood. I do like studs and drywall, but I do dabble in woodworking. Right. Right. So, well, uh, this is a whole other animal. I mean, you're basically dealing with a, a yeah. cylinder and then the veneers and yeah. So yeah, it was definitely a lesson. Uh, a lot of YouTube videos. <laughs> a lot of trial and error. How's it sound? Um, it Are sounds you, great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what you currently play on? Yeah. Oh, right on. I, I thought maybe it was going to be like, yeah, I just 
I gave it to someone or whatever, but... No, that's never leaving my possession. Uh, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I've actually been thinking lately about getting a separate one, just so I can kind of keep that one tucked away, because that's kind of my crowning jewel. And <laughs> Right, that's not necessarily to take it to the dive bar. <laughs> yeah, I, I get a little worried when, when we take it to gigs. I'm always like, ugh. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll get it out of the back of the truck, and I'll kind of smack the side, and I'm like, ugh. Oh, gets, oh. yeah, gets a lot of compliments, though, too. Yeah. I'll bet he does. Yeah. Um, so you guys, you've known each other since childhood. Yeah. yeah. Did you guys win the 8th grade talent show? We did. That's a funny story, though. Please. Um, <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> technically? Technically, te no. <laughs> technically, no. <laughs> and then there was a lot of angry students that were like. So. <laughs> and, like, there really shouldn't have been. It's it's funny, you know. <laughs> so what happened was. We went to middle school uh, out in Pahrump, which is about an hour north of Las Vegas, you know. So all our friends were really tight-knit. It was, like, a cool little you know, middle school type community, I guess. And we were playing Green Day covers. Yeah. yeah. And the name of the band was Wonderstick. <laughs> and our buddy Chase, who wow. we actually <laughs> muted the bass. It, so it was just me and David, yeah. actually. And like, we're just, you know, singing along. Um, but one of the judges was actually one of the tap dancers mothers. It was, it was her mom. <laughs> so of course she won first place yeah, or second place. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, Nepotism. <laughs> like, I, I'll never forget, I mean, you would have thought, like, the Beatles were there, or, or something, you know what I mean? We're just, like, playing these crappy Green Day covers, you know? Oh, but it's the timing. <laughs> and, uh, so, everyone's, like, booing at the end when they announce the winners, you know? And mm -hmm. we're just like, oh, whatever, we had fun, you know? And the next day in school, they announce on the intercom, they go, uh, there was actually a tie for second place. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Wonderstick. Backpedal, backpedal, backpedal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so whatever. Like, there was a lot of angry eighth graders. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, so with now, both of you have children. I do not. I do. Okay. Um, at the moment, you're just, just two piece, right? Well, no, we're we're a full four piece. Oh, um, yeah. We're just in the middle of uh, we're recruiting. Uh, we've recruited two new guys. All right. Um, so we kind of took a moment there to. Uh, work on the album. So, uh, you know, the album, you know, it's designed for a four piece, but David and I were the only uh, musicians and producers on this album, actually. So, okay. Um, now, is Jeff one of those other two? Um, Jeff's just a close friend and he still uh, jams with us time to time. I just think uh, during COVID and uh, certain, you know, work obligations. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's still close to the band, uh, you know, but. David and I did the, the album. Right on. Um, yeah, I, unfortunately, there's not a lot of information about you on online. Yeah. About the band or, or in, individually. So I had to do a little sleuth and a little deep dive and then figure out, okay, well, who's in the band? Because you didn't list that. Yeah. So um, I wasn't sure if Jeff was actually in the band or not, um, but that's fine. We're moving on. Um, so you have no kids, you said? No. But you do. I do. Okay. How do you balance being a musician and a dad? I, I, I can answer this. Um, I've done it, but... So I'll be honest, I, I actually walked away from music for a very long time because I didn't know how. And I didn't know I could have both. So it took me a really long time to learn that I can still be myself artistically and be a good father. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I was younger, that wasn't something I knew how to do. I just, I think there was a lot of pressure early on, you know, from family or whatever it was that I just needed to be this workaholic and put away guitar like it was this childish mm -hmm. thing. Um, even artwork, everything, I just put in a box basically and kind of hid who I was because I was chasing this, this dream, you know, and my kids are amazing and I would never trade them or a single moment of my life or my mistakes for anything. Um, however, you know, I've learned a lot of valuable lessons over the years about chasing the wrong people and chasing the wrong dreams for other people and learning that there's so much value in doing what you love and what you believe and the right people will, will stay in your life and the wrong people will dissipate from that. Um, so it's not something I see myself stopping at any point because honestly, the best lesson I could teach my kids is go for your dreams, no matter what anybody tells you. Um, but also have a safety net. <clears throat> sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, lucky for them, I think that safety net is loving family and, you know, loving parents and stuff, yeah. you know, you know, David and I, you know, you know, we have family that we cherish and love and stuff, but I think we both came from a background where it's like, you know, we kind of had to watch our own backs and we didn't always have that net. 
You know what I mean? Right. So it was, I don't know, for me, you know, it was a lot of... Well, speaking of children, uh, my daughter seems to be having a very good time caterwauling in her bedroom. So uh, I'll be right back. We're back. Um, for me, I had to also step away for about two years from music while I figured out, okay, I'm a dad. What does this mean? And, and at that point, I didn't have a, a band going on, so it was, a, it was a good time to step away anyway. And one of the best, I hate to say this, one of the best things that happened for me in terms of like raising my kid and, and instilling certain core things when she was very young, was, I was on unemployment. <laughs> so I was home and I was the main like influencer. Um, and, you know, Unfortunately, that's not always the case. So uh, now I'm, I'm happy to be able to, you know, have a job and pay bills and, that, and, and afford things. And uh, here she is now. You want to be on camera? No. We're back, kids. Um, moving on. If you could change one thing about the local music scene, what would it be? You want to go first? <laughs> uh, I would like there to actually be a m local music scene. I think there needs to be a lot more unity. Yeah, community. And, <laughs> um, so I'll give you an example. I moved I moved out of Nevada in 2005, and I was the front man for a band called Contest of Arms out in Orlando, Florida. Hmm. And the difference between what I saw in Florida and the difference between what I saw here in, say, Boston or New York or Chicago and even parts of California, is there was a unity of bands where it's like, if you're in a band, you supported your friend's band, you supported the other bands that played, you played shows together, and the best bands got together and did amazing shows and brought big crowds. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not you know, talking about anyone uh, in particular, because I've actually made a lot of friends recently, a lot of great people that want to change the scene. And I'm, I'm very proud of what I think is going to happen and what, what is happening. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't by any means a knock on the Vegas scene because I think it is morphing, it is growing, and I'm very uh, honored to be a part of it. However, for the longest time, it just, it seemed like, you know, this band didn't want their fans to be a fan of your band or, you know, they didn't want you to play shows at this venue because this was this band's venue. And what you're really doing there is you're not benefiting yourself very much. Is What you're doing is you're creating a segregation between mm -hmm. artists and you're separating people and you're, you're giving them an ultimatum to where it's like, well, you know, Vegas is the entertainment capital of the world, right? So there's something going on any given night of the week. So how do you ensure that people are going to your show? Well, Unite play a, a big show and, and get those bands together. There's just too much uh, naysaying, you know, because we all started somewhere. Mm -hmm. We all got to grow, and, and that's what it is. And I, I agree. I, right before uh, COVID, before quarantine happened, it seemed like it was getting there. There was a lot of, like, you could go to a show and know that you were going to get some support from the other bands, and, and <clears throat> it, at least I was feeling that way when I would go to some shows. But I agree with you. There's also a lot of gatekeeping, a, yeah, a lot it, yeah. of gatekeeping, especially in the punk scene and um, in the metal scene. Of just like we talked off camera about, you know, there's a there's a dress code. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. You know, what what are you doing? It's just rock yeah. and roll. And it's if, just music. And if it really is about like who's more punk rock or who's more hardcore, then you're missing the fucking point. Yeah. Are you familiar in, with Crimson Riot? Uh, yeah, I know the name. I've heard some really good things about them. Roxy Gun, Chris Chris Reject. Yeah, oh, okay. Church, yeah. Um, they have a song called uh, Not Punk Enough. Okay. And he's just like, you know, I'm sorry I'm not punk enough. Uh, in fact, their, their new album I, I did a review of just recently, um, link here, it's like, <laughs> is um, there's a song that Roxy sings about how I didn't realize that, you know, I, I had to ask permission. You know, I didn't realize that, you know, you were the fashion police. Right. And, and it's, to me, and, it's the same with music as well. Yeah, and that really irritates me, like, honestly, because it should never be about that. Mm -hmm. You should be able to be whoever you want to be and enjoy music. And, you know, you know, I think it really does stem from mistakes. And I'll be honest, I think in high school, I was very judgmental and, and, oh, you don't know that band, you're wearing that t-shirt. And like, I was that dick, you know what I mean? But like, the lesson I learned is like, that guy sucks and yeah. fuck that guy and fuck who I was, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it really is about the music and bringing people together because it doesn't fucking matter what color, religion, uh, your beliefs, what you look like, what you dress like. Music's supposed to be a universal language that we can all connect to, and 
all the other stuff's bullshit. And if that's what you're about, then, you know. I agree. You know. Um, <laughs> and before we move on to you real quick, I just want to touch on that, how, especially new musicians, just anybody under 21, really, if you're watching this, you're not going to be the same person you are in 10 more years. You're going to realize, <laughs> wow, I, I was an idiot. Yeah, I wasn't and, the same person a year ago. And then, yeah, yeah. and then in ten more years, you're going to look back and say, "Wow, I was still an idiot, but my yeah. but I, my choices had bigger consequences." I'm 48. I'm going to be 49 this this year, and I'm still looking back and saying, "Geez, I was an idiot." Yeah. Just, even just last year. Yeah. Um, but I mean, that's not even talking about relationships. <laughs> but yeah. uh, well, so, real quick, something I do stand by and something that, that I say a lot is: the older that I get, the less I know. Mm -hmm. But I find that comforting because I think by keeping yourself humble and knowing that you're always on this continuous growth uh, pattern, yep. you know, and you don't really know it all, that's the real key to growth, I think, is admitting that and, like, being strong enough to admit, like, you don't know shit and we're just all in this mixing pot together. Yep. And <clears throat> that's the most important thing. And stay humble and, you know, be nice. Fucking, yep. It doesn't take much. It doesn't, <laughs> really doesn't. Yeah, and, and just because you don't like a particular type of music doesn't mean it's not valid or good. Right. It just yeah. means it doesn't, you know, jazz you up. And that's fine. But at the same time, how about step back for a second and listen to things and look at things and, and get away from... Don't pay attention to the visual. Listen to the music and say, right, what is it that people are getting into? And who knows? You might discover that it actually is your thing. You just got wrapped up in the packaging. So it's right. Like, yeah. Damn. Yes. What, if you could change one thing about the local music scene, what would it be? Um, I honestly wish there was a lot more venues for local bands. Yeah, yeah. And again, you before know, quarantine, scene. there was. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, before I joined White in the Ashes, I had took a hiatus from music as well. I sold my drum set. I hadn't played drums in, you know, years. But I was kind of in the scene back in, you know, 2008 to about 2011 or so. Um, and it was a pretty decent local scene back then. There's a lot of venues, you know, um, there was somewhat community, but it was still really clicky, you know, certain bands yeah. always played with certain bands right. and like, you could never get on them shows with those bands. You always ended up playing with the bands from out of state on a Wednesday, you know, <laughs> that nobody's coming to. Right. <clears throat> but yeah, I just, I just wish there was a, a bigger, you know, just, just more places for a local scene to actually happen. I just think, you know, with Vegas, it's just so focused on the big entertainment, you know, the strip. You know, there's right. just not a lot of room right. for the, the, the little guys. But there is. We just need to make it. Right. Yeah. I will say there, there's a bar called Rock and Riley's. I think it's still in business on the strip right next to the Hawaiian Marketplace. And they were having, I, I've, I've done it, they were having original bands come in and play their original music. On the strip, and it was really cool, and like they, they even paid. It wasn't much, but you know, um, I thought, why can't that be more of a thing? Just call it, you know what? Let's every venue on the strip have a, a locals' night, even if it's you know Wednesday or whatever. It doesn't necessarily have to be a big tourist night, but have a Wednesday, or have a, a locals' night. I mean, because it's a whole other experience playing on the strip, just the load in and the load yeah. out. I think like one of the biggest challenges that David and I faced and the rest of the band faced was we get these like awesome gigs in these great places and they'd want three to four hours of covers. Yeah. And it's like, well, we're this original band, you know, what do we do? And we actually like, we had to learn some covers. We had to kind of like tough it up to play some places, but that was never our thing. That's never what we wanted to do. And even when I do a cover, I think we, we definitely put a twist on it. Um, and I have a lot of friends here in town that are great cover artists and are part of great cover bands and I'm not knocking it, you know, but that's what a lot of people that come here, they, they want that familiarity, you know what I mean? They, they probably come from a city where they have their own original artist mm -hmm. and Vegas probably isn't always the place for that, you know? Uh, so it's hard to break into being, you know, not only an original band, but like alternative and weird to begin with, you know what I mean? So it's, <laughs> right. it's like... But you know what, like, I think the conversation that we had when, we, when David and I first started this band was, even if the market's small, we know what we're doing. Like, we, we know that even if it's, if it's a small market, like, that's what we want to do. This is the music we're passionate about. And right. so we just kind of... Yeah, the number one thing you hear when you're starting, like, a YouTube channel or a podcast is don't be afraid to be niche. 
because okay. you know it may take a while and yes it's taken a while for this channel thank you every one of my subscribers uh it's taken a while but the people who are here are, are generally they're staying because they know exactly what they're getting yeah i'm not doing crazy you know youtube videos where i'm having a cost like how can i one up myself what you know i'm gonna stay awake for 24 hours i'm gonna you know do these crazy i'm gonna jump in a pool full of you know yeah dry ice or you know whatever <laughs> It, it's, I, I feel like, uh, you know, your music is good. It's, it's good music will attract people. The problem is, especially right now, it's hard to. It, it is. You know, and like before COVID, like you were saying, I mean, we played Bunkhouse. We opened up for Plague Vendor. Uh, super fun show. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone came in after we went on, but yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It, but like, <laughs> here's the thing. We, we spent, we spent <laughs> our years trying to make it quote unquote, yeah. that it really came down to like, okay, if we're going to do this, it's about the passion. It's about like, this is the music that we love to make and we don't care. Like, you know, if it's one person who's like, yay, then we're going to play for that one person or write for that one person or whatever. But it really comes down to, we believe in, you know, what we're doing. And, and I think it took me years to get to that point because honestly, I, I was part of groups that were bigger than Wyatt and the Ashes might ever be. I don't know. Uh, but I was chasing, like, that was the sound of the time, and that, you know, right. that's what everybody wanted. And now it's like, you know, I get to sit back, we get to sit back and write these songs where it's like, well, we just love this song. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think you've got, uh, you, you've managed to land nicely where you, you're playing bass for Jerk. They're, you know, a bigger band. Obviously, they're going on tour. You know. Yeah, yeah. And you also are doing, you're, right, you're, you're able to actually write and perform the music that is all you, all you guys. Correct. So um, I, I think you've got um, both worlds. I've gotten very lucky. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we've been very blessed. Um, but, you know, it was endless nights of going to these bars I've never been to, meeting the owners, meeting the people there, becoming friends with people. Um, and I really made it a point for the past three years, if I got invited to a show, if I was available that night, I would go, whether I was recognized for being there or not, just because I really felt this karma energy where it was like, yeah. Well, how can I expect people to drop whatever they're doing to come see me if I can't drop whatever I'm exactly. doing? And that that plays back into the scene where it's like, well, I could sit here and bitch about it all I want, but if I'm not going to be part of the solution, then I should go fuck myself. <laughs> you know what <laughs> yeah. I mean? Yeah. So I try to be part of that. I try to be part of that solution, honestly. <laughs> and it's, you know, and even if White and the Ashes wasn't in existence, I've met some incredibly amazing people. I've made some really good friends. Um, and in today's world, it's really hard, you know, to, especially as an adult, to meet people, trust people, and, and get that kind of thing. So I'm definitely blessed, I think, in that, and that I've made those kind of friends. So, yeah, I'm very cool. grateful. Uh, before we move on, in the interest of continuity, I don't know what's going on with Camera 3. It's it's dying. It won't stay on. Fuck Camera 3. <laughs> so, you're going to see this guy just, just struck the hair mostly. So, um... Uh, for those, just for the, the nip, I do occasionally hear from people who will be like, what's going on with your camera angles and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you know what? Page, the there's a link in the description for my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash room six. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to get like, you know, upgrade the gear, upgrade the videos. Uh, also, this is a good, actually, is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> room six dot shop, baby. Mm -hmm. Any money that comes into the channel goes right back into either making better videos or, this is the dream, putting on a showcase of everybody that's been on the show, five bands at a time. Be like, showcase number one, the first five bands, or acts. Yeah. Showcase number two, and paying the acts yeah. to come to a showcase. When's the last time that happened? And this guy's no bullshit. I, I met him at a bar at a show. Mm -hmm. He was supporting another local act, uh, Stanley Avenue, and that's where I met him. So he's not just sitting behind a camera; like he's out there too, yep. doing the same kind of thing and, and uh, spreading spreading the love. So. I try, and, and honestly, it's an excuse for me to show up. <laughs> to, it's like, well, honey, I gotta go out. <laughs> I gotta do a show. I I, I gotta go support them, and and, and oh. you know, also I'm gonna you know record some content. Yeah, yeah. but no, I I've been you know I've pledged two drunks in a bar. Oh, oh yeah. Two drunk, oh, yeah. two drunks in a bar. Oh, yeah. I, 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 I called that a tour. Yeah, at I, one time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I played to the sound guy. I, I'll never forget playing. <laughs> Another practice, guys. For, for the diehard Room Sixers, this will be a uh, you know quick quick throwback. I'll never forget playing uh, my first band. We were like the the Stones with Eddie Vedder singing. 
I was, okay. I was the Eddie Vedder. Oh. It, it was, it worked. It was a good sound. Um, and these are like 19 year old kids. I'm 22. We're playing a bar in San Diego. Literally two drunks and a bartender. It's, and it, I think it's like a Sunday night or whatever. And at one point, right in the middle of a solo, one of the drunks gets up, stumbles over, unplugs the distortion pedal from the guitarist and walk, and then stumbles out of the street. And we all just, just keep playing yeah. while he yeah. figures it out. Because, yeah. you know... That's practice. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I've had a pedal mysterious, somehow just come unplugged. Mm-hmm. No idea how. Right before the first song. <laughs> right before the first chord, which is, a, which is with distortion. And literally like, plink, plink, yeah. plink. Oh, yeah. <sighs> and, and sound person's like, the hell? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, what'd you do? Um, all right, um, moving on. Where did the name come from, Why in the Ashes? All right. And why it is from you. Okay. All right. Um, so, you know, I don't like, I don't advertise it, but I also don't want to lie. And I think, you know, you're genuine enough. And I think it's been, it's been about three years since we started it. I, I think I'll give you the honest. Ooh. So I'll give you the, I'll give you the, I'll give you the raw cut. I mean, uh, you know, viewer discretion. You know, I don't, I don't mean to get like cynical or dark. Um, so I'm, I'm not Wyatt. I named myself uh, after the band. Um, it was never intended to be. A lot of people think like, oh, it was like, like a solo project. Like you're Mr. Wyatt and the rest of the guys. Yeah, I thought just, Wyatt was your last name. Uh, I, I did take it on as a stage name, um, based off the band. It was definitely more of a yeah, no, no, it it, it is, it is. In all, in all fairness, AJ Wyatt, that, that's it. But it was never a, uh, you know, oh, I'm Wyatt and this is the Ashes. Um, to be honest, like going back to what we were talking about, how I was on that musical hiatus and you know had guitar put away for so long. Um, I was I was married um, for a while and we had a child that we lost. And his name was Wyatt. Oops. And I'm sorry to hear that. No, it's okay. Um, but really, it, it's a really beautiful thing. It's not. It's not something that I that I view as being dark or like, oh, woe is me. Um, you know, she was nine months pregnant. We lost him uh, during childbirth. Uh, he suffocated inside the womb. Um, so after after an experience like that, and being with. Um, you know, not to talk negatively about my ex-wife, but just being with the wrong person, I think, um, that kind of experience, like, opened up this honesty thing between us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she had admitted a lot of things and kind of, we, we decided after that, after we mourned, that it was time to move on. And that was kind of like my my reckoning, almost like a rebirth um, as an artist, because it was like, I finally had something to talk about again. I had something to write about Mm -hmm. and, uh, why in the ashes was just this idea that I had. And it was kind of like a tribute like type thing. Like, thank you for, you know, cause I actually felt a lot of guilt for a while that it was like this child lost his life so I could go make music. And there was like this guilt that I, I had gotten out of this horrible relationship or this bad situation. And, um, so it was kind of like a tribute thing, honestly. And, uh, you know, I really just chose to believe at that time and, and probably still now that that sacrifice was made so that I could live again, basically. And kind of where like the stereo urn, uh, you know, our symbol kind of comes into play. And I've really never publicly spoken on this very much um, or talked about it because I didn't want it to be kind of this like, woe is me type deal. Yeah. Um, but... You know, like it's been a while, and I think you know I don't have any problem saying that. Um, it was never about like, oh, well, I'm I'm Wyatt, and this is the ashes. Like that was right. like literally Wyatt's ashes was kind of like the the spark for this creative journey. And when I got back with David, you know, and I, <clears throat> you know, like our we rekindled our musical friendship, so to speak. You know, and I kind of let him on, you know, in on what was going on in my life. You know, all the guys kind of agreed, like, yeah, let's let's do that. You know, and then we kind of had like an ongoing joke for a while where we tell like a different story of what it meant. You know what I mean? But I just don't feel comfortable with myself like lying or making anything up at this point. Um, there's just no point. Uh, but definitely not a 
woe is me, feel bad for me type thing because people go through this all the time, I've learned. And um, if anything, maybe this will help somebody else. So, wow. Well, yeah. I'm obviously, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss. I, Thank you. Yeah. Um, no, it, you know, I, not that I'm comparing at all. Right. But uh, I actually, one of the things that led to my first marriage uh, ending was a miscarriage. Okay. Um, and it, it's, it, there's, there's no, there's nothing you can do except move on. But right. Yeah. Wow. Well, I was going to follow up with a silly question, but we're going to skip that. <laughs> okay. Um, but thank you for, thank you for telling oh, me. Thanks, thanks for having me and you're very welcome. And, uh. Yeah, that's the thing. Actually, I feel like at the time of recording, we just finished. It's barely June, and May was Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, one of the things that unites a lot of musicians is mental health problems. Let's be honest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Especially yeah. singers. Right. We're insecure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, David. Have I always been the sane, stable one? Yes. Um, oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> it's worth hanging around. It will get better. It happens to a lot of people, and all you can do really is try and find something that makes you happy, yeah. and and at the very least, try and find <clears throat> something that doesn't make you sad. And if that's a person, if that's you know a drug, don't do things that try not to do things that will hurt you. Try not to make it worse. But if you need anybody, there's there's people to reach out to, including me. All right, <clears throat> moving on from that. Yeah, I was going to ask you a question about is cereal soup, but we're what? Gonna, is cereal soup, but we're going to move on. Yeah, if it's soggy enough, it becomes soup. Oh well, if you want, I mean, if you want to go down there, I right, I'll go down there. Yeah, you soak it long enough, and uh, I use almond milk. Uh, but if it gets soggy and wet enough, it becomes soup. Unless there's like some kind of pun I'm like missing to this nope. joke. Okay, how about you? Do you think cereal is soup? What's that? Actually, what's that cold soup? Oatmeal right. soup. <laughs> it's heated. If it's hot, it's soup. If it's hot, okay, it's soup. Actually, if it's cold, it's cereal. What I was going to say was pick By definition. I was going to say... I was going to say... All right. Sorry. 180. Here we go. I was going to say pick one to answer. Is okay. cereal soup, is a hot dog a sandwich, or is how many chickens would it take to kill an elephant? Okay. Uh, well, just the other day, I had a hot dog, vegan hot dog sandwich because I ran out of hot dog buns. So I used a hamburger bun. And cut the hot dog into pieces and put it on a sandwich. Isn't that technically a hamburger? Ah, if you cut it in pieces, then it, I, it definitely is a sandwich. But it's on a hamburger, so technically now it's a hamburger. No. Maybe? Or a pork burger. Hey, I'm open to any point of view. Let's be I mean, honest. Hot dogs aren't pork. If that's yeah. what you well, see. Well, it, well it, wasn't, it wasn't pork anyways. But. Whatever, whatever you identify that sandwich as, like I still pork. Here's my thing. If a hot dog's a sandwich, that makes a lobster roll a sandwich. Because literally it's the same Ugh, shape of butter. I, I, don't do, I don't do the sea critters. I know, but however, imitations equally as disgusting. If you put <laughs> if you if you put tofu in a hot dog bun, are you calling it a tofu sandwich? No, I call it I'm high. <laughs> <laughs> I'm high as fuck. <laughs> oh, I've done some wow. crazy combinations that I just thought would be good. Oh man, and just yeah, Please, that's uh, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. that's a good one. All right, I'm rolling. Ooh. Um. You good on drinks? Do you need anything else? I'm good. I'm so good at the moment. Okay, cool. Now we're going to move into actual general, the usual questions. Cool. How long have you been doing music individually? Just like in your life. So I started musically. I mean, I started in sixth grade. I was playing not the tuba, the one below the tuba. <laughs> The baritone? Oh, oh okay. Yeah, so the big baritone. Okay. I'm like, yeah. there's a smaller size of tuba? <laughs> yeah. I, that's, not, that's how I always remember. This is how good I was. Yeah. So so I was playing baritone, um, and it came time to... I never knew how to play the thing. I never bothered to learn. But it came time to for the final. So the teacher was like, all right, here's your music. Play the song. So I was like, okay, well, I had this little <clears> trick on my my baritone that I just... I would, the keys would stick, and I knew it. So I smacked them down before he called me. I was like, "Oh, my horn's broke. I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't do the thing." He's like, "Well, just put take your mouthpiece out and borrow his." And I wasn't expecting that, so I grabbed it right, and I'm sitting there looking at him, and I go, "Can I play drums?" 
<laughs> <laughs> and he's all, yeah, yeah, get back here. <laughs> so that was, so it. That, that was about it, yeah. That's then, uh, awesome. That's a good, that's so, a good music teacher. <laughs> yeah, so I played snare for a little while, just barely, not really did anything. I just kind of hung out in the back. And then I finally got my first drum set uh, when I was about 11. My dad got it for me for Christmas. And I dibbled a little bit. And I didn't really get serious. And actually, kind of until I met AJ honestly yeah uh, we have a video of us in his his bedroom yeah. when we were kids oh and really he, yeah, and yeah he's playing something and and I'm like, like I start going and I just I'm just doing a real fast punk beat and I just I don't know how to I'm I like didn't know too, timing he's all time out too fast too man. fast too bud. fast <laughs> now I'm like speed yeah. up motherfucker <laughs> no uh but yeah so yeah but I mean I started technically playing drums when I was about a Back in like eighth grade, like David was good, man. Like everyone in school was, oh, he was like the Travis Barker at our school, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what? Travis Barker is one of those, like if, if you don't know, you just kind of see the package, so so to speak. Yeah. Okay. And you listen to Blink 182's music. Uh huh. But then you you watch him sit down on a practice pad. Oh, dude's a beast. I, I oh, yeah. Because I'm, 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 tra- I'm learning drum myself. Uh, I got an electronic drum set up there in room six and, and, uh, and I sit down on a practice pad, and then I watch a video of pra- Travis Barker, and I'm just like, ugh. Yeah. yeah. Why? 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 He's, def- he's definitely bother, a beast. Yeah. He's definitely a beast. I'd never, ever knock him. You know I mean? Like, obviously, yeah. like, we're not on his level. You know what I mean? But, you know, like, people knock him too much for, like, being as big as he is. And I'm like, you know what? It doesn't matter if this yeah. drummer can outdo tra- Travis Barker. The fact is, the thing that at least I credit him the most on is he kind of innovated some of that modern pop punk stuff that you know you didn't really hear in that genre you know and he kind right. of he not, not necessarily like did first but he definitely modernized like that sound in some of his fills and like you know hi-hat also uh, trey hit. from green day <clears throat> going back to the green day oh covers. dude okay yeah. and if we're talking trey yeah trey over travis and let, i mean let, fucking, let's I'm not sorry, get any fucking day let's not get into taylor hawkins day. from the foo fighters <laughs> oh yeah taylor yeah. hawkins make, makes me angry because i'm like you're too fast like Girl, think about it. If David Grohl had to like step off drums to be the front man, imagine, like, of course, his drummer is <laughs> yeah. going to be the fucking beast. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. um yeah. I'm I'm currently working on Monkey Wrench because I I made the mistake of telling my drum teacher I won't learn Monkey Wrench, and I thought I had it, and then I listened to it, and I actually listened like. I'm like 30 beats per minute too slow. <laughs> Ladies oh and gentlemen at home, he's gonna get monkey wrench. He's gonna he's gonna nail it. It's, oh. gonna, it's gonna be great. It'll be up shortly. Oh, I'm 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 good on it at, at speed except for one note on the kick the kick pedal. One note's missing. You're thinking like a scientist, thinking like a musician. Oh well, yeah, that's my problem. I'm Bang a, it. I've always been a singer, a lyricist, a, a songwriter, okay. a guitarist, a songwriter, and drums is a whole other thing where every limb is independent. And it is. you think you're you think you got it. I can't do it. Yeah. I, I, I try and do it and like David will make fun of me. <laughs> like I mean I think like creatively, like we'll put our heads together sometimes, you mm-hmm. know, and like even on guitar, like David will say, like, oh try this on guitar, you know, and like I'll take his advice and be like, Oh wow, I never thought of it that way. And then like vice versa, you know what I mean? But like as far as keeping time and like playing a kit, like it's a laughing stock. I'm not even allowed behind his, his kit. <laughs> Honestly, for years I was like I was I was considering myself a burgeoning hand drummer, percussionist. I got, a, I have a, a djembe over there somewhere. Uh, I got a cajon, uh, a couple bongos, but me so cajony, baby. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, the thing is, it never the desire. And then I, um, my drummer at the time, Sean Flum, who also teaches drums, and you know he teaches instruments. He's, I was like, hey man, you know, you feel like teaching me. Just I, I just I want to know what the heck I'm trying to do here. Yeah, and he did, <clears throat> and now I I'm hearing things and I'm picking up things. Lessons actually matter, guys. Lessons lessons are for a reason, even yeah. if it's just for a little while. Yeah, you really. Yeah. I admit up. that now. Yeah, that's like, why I, that's I why I'm not yeah. as good as I should be. I feel like you know, <laughs> um, well, I'll let David finish uh, before going to my spiel. But oh uh, no worries. Um, I actually that's one of the one of my very early on videos was about. Do you need lessons? Like, do lessons matter? Mm-hmm. Like here, uh, but I I really was so glad I did it. Unfortunately, he, Sean's in Kansas City now. He's also my whiskey, uh, you know, uh, podcaster partner guy. So we're figuring out how to do it remotely. But um, how long have you been doing music? Oh, wait, no, we we covered that, right? Yep, covered that for me. Okay. How long have you been doing music? Yeah, we're back. We're, we're on you. <laughs> um. 
So I've always, honestly, I've always had a diehard passion for it. I always wanted to be in a band. I never wanted to be like an Elvis Presley as a kid. Like I didn't like Elvis Presley. I always wanted to, like, I love the Beach Boys, honestly. And that was my first favorite band of all time. And like playing my role and like being a part of a band was like always what I wanted. And, you know, it's funny. It was actually Chuck E. Cheese, like seeing the mechanical bands. Like seeing, you know, the freaking hound dog and the bird and like Chuck E. Cheese up there. Jasper T. Jazz. And, you know, my grandmother <laughs> used to take me out in Boston. Uh, you know, we moved out there for a little bit. And she'd take me to Chuck E. Cheese to see the bands. And my dad actually ran sound for the Beach Boys for a little under 10 years. And so the Beach Boys music always r reminded me of him. So when we moved away to Boston, like I, I would think of him and remember him. And ironically, in the Chuck E. Cheese, the main like Chuck E. Cheese hub in Boston... There's two rooms. It was like the main characters in this house, like singing. They play like you know, "I'm a Soul Man," like you know, hits from all across different generations of music. And then next door was these hound dogs on a stage, and they were in the traditional Beach Boys uh, white and red stripe garb from like their early '60s. Um, the Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Oh, You're not gonna been... get that nowadays. This uh, must have been back in the day. Uh, this must have been '91, '92. Maybe so it's, so it's like the freaking uh, bear jamboree. So this, yeah, this was like you know the the height of mechanical bands, if you will. You know what I mean? Um, so I was just like obsessed with going to the Beach Boys room and watching these guys play, and they only played Beach Boys songs. So just like the harmonies and everything, like that was like my thing. I wanted to be in a band and sing that harmony and, and do that thing. Um, but I didn't get real serious about it until. About the same time, David, you know, I was probably 12 or, or 13. Uh, I was probably just out of fifth grade or whatever. I got my first pawn shop guitar. And I remember the music video, I think, at the time that was like, I'm going to fucking do that, was Blur Song 2. Oh, and geez. there was just something so, like, energetic about that song in that video. And he hits his distortion pedal and they go flying up against the wall. And I'm like, that's what I fucking want. You know, but I started on acoustic. I started like a cheap, like, yeah, uh, pawn shop acoustic. Um, and had, you know, several hand-me-down type of like electric guitars after that. Um, but you know, it's probably only in the recent, like three, four years, I really dove into like perfecting that craft. And I always, I always use the excuse like, well, I'm not a mathematical, uh, guitar player. I don't need to know musical theory. I don't need to know any of this stuff. And I was all self-taught. David was self-taught. Um, but having so much passion for the craft now as an adult, I'm like, whatever tool that I can be given mm -hmm. to better that craft or know more about that, I want that now. Like, I'm proud that I loved it enough to fucking stick through it and do it with without knowing all that stuff. Right. But man, would it be easier for me So to you, do you're that, a lot yeah. like me where you're like, oh, I wish I had, you know, practiced this more or I wish I had, I wish I knew more. Oh, music, absolutely. Music theory. Oh, absolutely. Because I actually went to school at one point during the many years, many, many times I went to college trying to figure out who I was and what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, I was a voice major, you know, singing. At one point, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. I thought I wanted to, <laughs> and then uh, Masters of the 20th Century Grand Opera is what did it for me. I'm like, wait, this is boring. I don't, I want to just perform. Let me just go perform. So right, I, right. I actually, at that point, I dropped out of college like an idiot. But I, uh, I had a thought, where was it? Do you ever look at someone and wonder what is going on inside their head? Oh yeah, music theory, and just like, like I I started uh, practice piano lessons at seven. I wish I still had, I wish I had all that. I can sit down on the piano and play two songs now to this day. I can sight read, but I don't do it. I wish I had that. I wish right. I had the music theory that I had uh, learned when I was in college as a singer. Yeah. For instruments. And even outside of theory, that in the, the education of music, like even dabbling in more bands or learning more band songs, like I've I've been in hardcore metal bands, you know, through my childhood and, you know, high school and stuff. And a common thing you'd hear amongst like metal guitarists is, man, I wish I, I didn't dick around so much with like Corn and Limp Biscuit and actually learn Metallica and Megadeth and, and some of these other uh, more si symphony driven mm -hmm. uh, classical type, you yep. know, metal guitarists. Uh, so that, that's common too. You know, I wish, you know, instead of dicking around with Green Day covers, you know, maybe I had dove deeper into yep. something like that, you know. Say what you want about Metallica and Lars Ulrich, but they were one of the first metal bands to introduce like new 
different time signatures in the same song and things like that. I remember being in, in uh, one of my music theory classes and the teacher played Metallica. I forget which song, but it was one of the ones where it goes from like 4-4 four, four to 7-8. So, you know, it bounced all <laughs> over the place. And he was pointing out, see, and there's this and this. And he was trying to connect with you know, the kids. <laughs> but, yeah, any time you hear time changes in a, in a, in a song... That's the band saying, hey, look, we're more than just this mold, this particular right. pigeonhole. Right. So, all right. Uh, moving on? You done? Yeah. Okay, cool. Moving on. How long have you been wide in the ashes, you two? So, David, it's funny because it was probably about 2017, 2018, I first reached out to him, maybe 2017, and he, for whatever reason, was always the first drummer I envisioned in my band just because we go back so long. And for whatever reason it was, even though like we weren't close friends anymore and had gone years without even speaking to one another, you know, we, we remained friends on social media or whatever. So <laughs> here I am. I got this stupid name. I've got this brand new guitar I got and like one song. And I'm like, David, <laughs> here's my idea. You've got to hear me out, man. Like Picture this. this. Like this is what I envisioned. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, man, like, sounds cool, you know, but, you know, I'll think about it, you know, and it wasn't until maybe a year later, I got with some of the other guys, the original members of White and the Ashes, and we kind of started dabbling, and I was posting, like, little videos here and there of us doing stuff, and David hits me up, he's like, yeah, so about that drumming position, uh, I kind of get it more now, so, uh. and it's funny, because I don't even think, so he didn't even have a set, yeah. a kit, he had his electric kit, because he was living... In an environment, I guess, you know, he couldn't have it. So, like, it went from, hey, man, you know, will you be in this band to, like, hey, I built you or I built us this kit for me to play. And, you know, Jeez. it was like. What, you, so, you guys had that show coming up <clears throat> and he made a flyer for it and he had the three guys, you know, the faces. Um, oh, you so, did the thing where you booked a show without the band? No, he had, he had, <laughs> he had the, the three. It was a three piece at the time. Um, cause he was with his roommate out in Ely. And so I took my face and I photoshopped it onto the flyer <laughs> and I, and I sent it to him. <laughs> Jeez, I can see myself yeah. in the band. And, and then he was like, dude, I'm like, you serious? Like, is that you saying you want to be in the band? Yeah. And I was like, well, I was like, I'll come over and like chat with you. So I, I, I went over that, that Saturday and, and we talked and he showed me some stuff and played me a couple songs on yeah. the acoustic. And I was like, yeah, man. I was like, I don't have a kit right now, but, you know, we'll figure it out. Details. <laughs> yeah. And then I ended up actually taking that electric kit and trading it for uh, some random kit. But you showed up first day with it, right? No, I didn't even show up with it. I just showed up by myself. Okay. But right once in. we finally got together, right? Because it was like this weird chemistry where we're bouncing back and forth. So for those of you watching that don't know where Ely is in comparison to Las Vegas, uh, it's about three and a half. Four hours. Four hours. Four, four and a half. Um, so basically, I'm jamming with a guitar player up there and then coming back to Vegas every other week and teaching whatever we wrote to the bass player and to David. So it was like we booked our first show as a whole mm -hmm. without them even meeting. Yeah. And I think the first actual wow. flyer with us as a four piece was all four of you that I had like photoshopped in and then. <laughs> So, so, but the first practice we actually had all together, he comes with this, uh, before he built his kit, he comes with this acoustic kit and he had gotten the urn stereo, uh, image right, on, yeah, on the yeah. You were just already bought into yeah. it. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, half-ass anything. I whole-ass everything. So, <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, so I, I got some real just cheap pearl kit off, off a of Craigslist or offer up, I think. And it just sounded like straight garbage. Um, so I actually played the first show with that one. And then I was just like, I was like, yeah, I can't play on this kit. Cause my old kit before that was, uh, early nineties Yamaha rock tour, you know, maple yeah. from Japan. Yamaha. Yeah. And I was like, that kit sounded so good. I was like, I need, I need a maple kit. So I ended up taking all the hardware off that pearl kit and putting it on my new kit that I built. So I basically just, you know, I did all the stuff from my kit and then just transferred yeah. everything over. Right on. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, moving on. Okay. How long have you been in Nevada? So I was born and raised in Vegas. Uh, David's been born, here basically his whole life. Yeah, basically my whole life. I was born in California. Which part? I, uh, Barstow. Hey! Yeah. My mom lives in Victorville. <laughs> and uh, my so dad. So Nevada, 
Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. But no, I, I'm 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 SoCal enough to say SoCal. <laughs> you know that that's uh, I moved here 16 years ago about, but for some reason I always consider myself Californian. Yeah, I consider myself Vegas because uh, yeah, I was born in Barstow, but my family moved out here when I was one. So yeah. Really okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, all right, musical influences. I want to talk about what what was the earliest musical influence that made you say I want to do. I want to do that, whether it's a genre or a particular artist or a record or what. Hmm. First one that I actually wanted to do something with. Uh, Your earliest musical influence, yeah. Earliest music, probably Weezer. Hey. Yeah. Uh, one of the kids down the street from my house when I was a kid, he got a Weezer CD, and I was like, oh, these guys are cool. And yeah. then that kind of opened my musical mm -hmm. genre up, because I remember back then I was like, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was really into Spice Girls. Hey, hey. <laughs> so that was kind that of where ginger I was at. Though. Yeah, and then uh, and then I said, and then they they showed me some Weezer, and then Weezer turned into No Doubt. No Doubt turned into you know Green Day. Are you and familiar then... with the band called the Cheeks here in town? Cheeks. Yeah, yeah, I, I am. I know those guys. They're, they're they're basically trying to be like the new No Doubt with Heidi singing and yeah, they got they got a good unique thing going on. They're really nice individuals. Um, yep. I've, I've met yep. them. Yep. They're they're around some of the other people I hang out with. So um, I haven't gotten the honor of being able to see them live yet. Uh, however, I hear great things and yeah. I, I support them no matter what. Uh, Ryan and Heidi were here uh, and they, they performed upstairs. Oh, cool. They, they were a hoot. They were, they were a yeah. handful, man. But uh, yeah, a lot of what they're doing because of, you know, life is they've been doing a lot of like house parties and things like that. Yeah. So that's not, you don't get really notified like, right. like hey, there's a But it has been fun and growing that whole local thing. Like, you know, when That's you make a house thing. party or a karaoke thing, it's like, it, it becomes personal and yeah. you get to know those people. Then it's like, oh, well, whatever they create after that, like I've already established that they're good peeps and I'm going to support that. Yeah. If somebody, if somebody sees you at a house party, they're more than likely going to show, show up to your show at a venue. I think so. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you're not a piece of shit. Right on. <laughs> How about you? Uh, earliest musical influence? So I got lucky because my dad, um, so when my parents had me, they were a lot older. They were in their forties. My dad's a Vietnam veteran. And he, like a lot of, uh, parents, like of our generation, they grew up on like more classic rock. Mm -hmm. My dad hated that shit. Anything like, like after Vietnam that reminded him of the war, he didn't like, he didn't like oh, hair metal, wow. he didn't like any of that stuff. Uh, when things went more psychedelic, he was very against that because it triggered things from, uh, Vietnam. Um, so I was lucky enough to grow up on all these rock and roll, Love and Spoonful, Paul Revere and the Raiders, the Animals, uh, Beach Boys. I mean, the list goes on. Um, Obviously, <laughs> and, and that was very um, strong for me in my life and, and, and establishing what I wanted to do as far as being in a band um, and those fundamentals, you know, like actually knowing that that punk rock T stemmed from before the Ramones that, you know, it came from, you know, yeah. Louie Louie, you know, and, and those types of things. So, you know, he was an avid show goer and a big sound guy. So, um but he was, he's honestly like one of the most talented individuals I know. Uh, I, I love him to death and I'm glad that we've gotten closer in my adult life uh, than I ever was as a kid. However, um, watching him not pursue those things with his talents and being a, almost afraid of, mm -hmm. of fame or like success yeah. and staying so like in this box, um, it actually did a lot for me where I was like, well, I'm going to take what you taught me and I'm going to push it and not be afraid, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I, so I'm really thankful for that. Um, so that'd be the earliest, but you know, later on, you know, it was Green Day, it was the punk bands, um, you know, Dead Kenny, some of that like eighties, like thrash sound was like really big for me. Cause it was kind of surfer ish. Right. And it kind of was reminiscent, uh, the very whimsical, like even the way I write sometimes, like, you know, I like to do very melodic, but I also like to stay mysterious, like dark too, and just kind of whimsical. Um, so those were some of my early influences, but I mean, my first CD was Aqua Barbie girl. I think it was the first CD I actually bought. Wow. Uh, now, now cassettes in my defense, I had, you know, everything from Pearl Jam to Metallica or whatever on cassette, but my first CD was Aqua. Kids, Aqua. Kids, there were these things called cassettes. Yeah. And now that, Wow. Cassettes. My first was uh, Billy Ray Cyrus. I don't remember my first. That's Achy, old. Breaky Heart. But, Holy shit! That but, was my um, jam. <laughs> really quick, touching back on that eighth grade talent show, uh -huh. it I was amused to see that 
and, and to, to type that question out because I had an eighth grade talent show as well. Uh, we did the the cars. Oh, nice! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember which one. Um, that would have been your Green Day, basically. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. I remember. I don't. We didn't win. I'm sure, but but we just lip synced. That's all we did was just lip synced. But I remember. I was. I was sitting there. And I was like, I can viscerally remember being on the stage wearing plaid pants because I'm the last of five children and I got hand me downs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was really funny. Um, which, speaking about memories, segue. Hey, um, what's your favorite show memory? Some show you've done together. Where, I don't know. So as White like, in the Ashes or just yeah. separately? Enjoyable? Yeah, and it, it could be bad. It could be good. Whatever. But yeah. Favorite um, show memory. It doesn't have to be. Because you guys are fairly new. Yeah, yeah. We definitely are. Um, you know, right away what comes to mind is I was, I, I felt really fortunate enough being a new band that we got some of the spots that we did pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. But also saying that, I'm also, I also feel really lucky that during COVID, we had as much open arms as we did. And we were playing shows up in northern Nevada in Pahrump. And we did a Pahrump show where we had lost our second guitar player, our lead guitarist. Which I think even as my, like, we all kind of viewed as, like, being a really strong glue. Um, just, he was just a really talented guy. Um, you know, unfortunately, to certain circumstances, uh, he's not part of the group anymore. Um, but we're like, oh, the show must go on. So we became a three piece and I was like, I'm going to play the leads and the rhythms as best as I can. We'll, 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 we'll fill in, you know, with some extra bass lines or whatever it was. And we had such a huge outturn to this prompt show. It was up at the bearded lady. And I think we had more Vegas individuals come for that show than we probably had at a Vegas show. Yeah. And it, it's funny that that it was, happens. It was, it was packed and like everybody was like, it was like family and like there were very open arms. Yeah. There was actually people singing the songs. Yeah. The oh, that, yeah. That's and that was, one of those rock and roll moments you just check off. Yeah. It was and, just a great show. Yeah. I was going to say the same and thing. Like you said, yeah. for a new band to hear that and only having like a few demos out, I think at the time, like the EP yeah. wasn't even fully out. Like to hear that screaming back at me or whatever. And like, you know, they were so dedicated that even the covers that we did, which were kind of like deep cut unknowns by bands, like favorite bands of ours, they went into like know those songs too. So when we play those covers, like they're singing those as well. And that was just a fun night. And I remember kind of getting off stage and looking at David and kind of having this flashback of like knowing him in the eighth grade going like, that was good. Like that was the one, man. Like that was really fun. Right and that's why we do this, you know, like that was that feeling that I got was like that full satisfaction, like no matter nice. what. Yeah. How about yeah. you? Same, same yeah, memory? I was gonna say the same thing. Yeah, there was, there was yeah. just some, there was just something in the air about that show, man. It was just, yeah, it was, it was a good game. Yeah, <laughs> right on. Uh, moving from favorite show memory, favorite venue, and it doesn't have to be one you played at. Just favorite Vegas venue or local venue, I should say, Nevada. Local. So I love anybody that will have us. Yeah. <laughs> um, <Hey. laughs> but for some reason, I. I when I first started Wyatt in the Ashes, I really coveted the bunkhouse for some reason. Like that was where, well, that's where like I envisioned like we were gonna have like a huge like breakthrough or something. And and you know it wasn't necessarily that way, um, but it was really cool when we did get invited to open up for Plague Vendor, which is a bigger sign, you know, national act. Right. Uh, you know, so just being able to do that uh, it was really cool. That was like, oh wow, like I manifested this thing and like it kind of happened but honestly i think if we're in it and we're having a good time and everyone else is having a good time then that's the place to be i think i don't, I don't really favor anybody in particular and i'm still getting to know everybody so hey how about you yeah i was having mean, venues that i've been to i mean they're all fine i mean i like the house of blues that's a decent venue but to play or to hear bands just to hear bands right like so for, as far as playing yeah. um you know with why I mean we've only really played bunkhouse out here. Um, bunkhouse, uh, is that it? Yeah. Um, but back in the day, there was a there was a video called the farm, and I actually I like. I remember one. the I remember seeing it online. Yeah. I, I haven't been there. There was um, something about it. it. Had a cool little vibe. It had like a, it was just a little stage, yeah. and it was you know it was, it was just it was just strictly local bands and you know it was made, like a mini made, Woodstock. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it was just you know bands from out of state. That were you know not signed or anything like just little local bands and it's intimate. It was small, but 
it was still, I don't know, there's just something about it. it just had that vibe. Yeah, the big one for me was definitely uh, the actual Huntridge Theater back in the day. Oh, yeah. I saw the Dick Kennedys uh, I there. Missed, I never got uh, an opportunity. Yeah, that was the big, that the was like I, I wanted to always play it. there. Yeah, I learned about it about two months after it closed down. And I was so upset. I was like, that sounds awesome. And I said, well, Huntridge Tavern. I'm seeing bands there. I go in Huntridge Tavern. I'm like, this is not, yeah, very, this is not the Huntridge awesome, awesome, awesome place. You know, great, great place to go and hang out. It uh, is. But very different. Yeah. yeah. Very different. yeah. That, you, you don't need your big rig to play the Huntridge Tavern. Yeah. That's where I got the scar was the Huntridge right here. Got it in the mosh pit. <laughs> really? Yeah. At Huntridge Tavern? No. Oh, right it's funny. Like, once upon a time, I was like, how can you mosh pit at that place? Uh, it's so yeah. small. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was scared to go in a pit, and now, like, they scatter if I try. <laughs> it's like, noise. I'm not that big. It's the beard. And, yeah, maybe. And that, like, angry, intense look I get in my face when I'm you're, excited. You're, I wanna... you're the old guy that you were scared of back in the day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, also so, favorite. from favorite venue, let's talk gear. Now, we have a drummer here, so, you know, if you need an hour, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> the most expensive gear in the place. Yeah. 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 That being said... He started. He started in the band with no gear. No gear. And he <laughs> said, "I'm gonna make my own." Yeah. But um, what are you currently rocking when you go to a show? Your handmade kit, yeah, apparently. My custom kit. Yeah. Fancy. David Tracer custom drums. <laughs> <laughs> DT <laughs> Customs. Yeah, went went real real fancy with that one. That name, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's what I rock. And then uh, right now I'm, I'm um, dude, I got Sabian cymbals. Uh, I got the double AXs. Uh, used to like Zildjian's, but they just didn't carry the same. The Zildjian's, to me, from what I understand, again, beginner, barely, barely beginner drummer. My understanding is Zildjian's are better for studio necessarily. Yeah, the exactly. They, for... they, they don't have that that Sabian, range yeah. that Sabian has. Sabian but, is way better live. Also especially more bang for the buck. Yeah, yeah. yeah. especially uh, if you're trying you to cut through there, a lot of noise. <laughs> trying to cut through a lot of noise, I understand the longer note the better. Yeah, but there's only two of you, so. <laughs> But uh, Sabians, so uh, what are you doing for your sticks or just whatever uh, you find? I usually do Vic Firth or Vader's, whichever's cheaper at the time. Right on. <laughs> I don't even know what I have. I have yeah. whatever came with the kit, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I usually stick with a 5B uh, <clears throat> and just whatever brand. Uh, I usually stick with Vader or Vic Firth, though, because I, I have gone some of the, the cheaper routes where you just get the brick for like 6 bucks and they're just horrible. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Costco drums. Yeah. 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 How about you? Uh, so, are you uh, any particular heads or just? Uh, I use uh, Evans hydraulics. Okay, I haven't heard about the hydraulics. Yeah, so they're actually uh, they're two ply and they have actually a little thin layer of oil in them, so it, make, it keeps them like so you really? don't have to have any dampeners or anything on. So a lot of people use dampeners on their heads, and I don't know from my experience with the hydraulics is they always. They always sound how I want them to sound. <laughs> what more can you yeah, ask for? Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. super fancy and, and keen when it comes to like you know the, the perfect pitch of a drum. Like I've watched you know DW drum videos where they're teaching you how to actually like you know tap the side of the, the drum and actually get it to the correct note and all that. And I'm just like that's way above my head. Um, I just put them on and make sure they're the same you know tightness around and, and they sound good. <laughs> How about you? What are you rocking? Blues break. Cool. Um, do you want to cut and I'll refill? Oh no. That, oh, okay. just... sorry if I ruined it. It's okay. Um, so, <clears throat> so I've had a lot of amps over the years. I think my go-to as far as gigging, um, especially for the size of the places that we're going to, uh, I have a Fender Twin Reverb, uh, it's the 60s reissue, um, and, and uh, I, I absolutely love that amp. Um, guitars, um, tried a few guitars like over the past couple of years, definitely fell in love with this 70s uh, custom Telecaster that I have. Ooh, nice. uh, it's got a nice humbucker on the neck, very warm, very ballsy guitar with a lot of high end as well, uh, especially for Telecaster. Um, and it was kind of weird because at first I was, I was so acoustic. I was writing all the songs on acoustic. I had the acoustic and we, when we actually started playing as a four piece, I still had the acoustic live and then we had the electric guitar player. Um, cause I found it really hard for some reason to switch back over to an electric after rocking the acoustic for a while. Mm -hmm. So I went to a hollow body like Gibson for a while and then just put really fat strings. I put really big strings, <laughs> like the biggest string you can get is pretty much like what, what like I put 15s or something what I put on a Telecaster. Uh, 
forget what they are. Um, the mammoths, the the Ernie Ball mammoths, I think. Oh, is the, dang! The, yeah, yeah, I like them big. Like a bass player almost. <laughs> I like them big. Um, he likes them round. <laughs> <laughs> thick and juice. Yeah, okay. Um, so and then uh, picks. I really like these snarling dogs. Uh, called snarling dog. They're like nylon, but they, they have like a grip, and I really like that over like a Tordex. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. Powder I type. Textured. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I just really like that. I don't lose them as much. Um, and then, oh, like pedals, I have to. Strymon, thank you. Uh, they give me a little bit of a discount. Strymon. Oh, right on. You got a sponsorship. Yeah. It's like, a, I spent a lot of fucking money, so I get the oh. discount. Non sponsorship, <laughs> sponsorship. But Strymon, I still stand by them. Mm-hmm. Um, hey, if you want to you know, sponsor a video. Not that not that <laughs> other like pedals into the trick, but I, I really fell in love with. Uh, so my pedal board basically is um, I have the Strymon Sunset for my dual distortion. I basically use like one as like a booster and the other as like a, my set distortion. And then I use the El Capistan tape delay. For my delay pedal, um, I use a uh, TC Electronics pitchfork for some of my like weird pitchy stuff what's, that we do in what's a couple the of pitchfork? Songs. So basically, um, it has several different settings, and what it does, it'll just when you when you hit it, uh, it'll take whatever you're playing and change the pitch of that. So, so you can actually oh, like pitch. You can essentially guy, like. Yeah play bass tones on an electric guitar or vice versa. Okay. Um, so when we went three piece, that was kind of an ideal thing for me. So I started splitting the, the Fender uh, twin reverb with a PV bass amp essentially and like uh, nice. in dual stereo yeah. and kind of had like the low end, the high end and then, you know, tying it in with like a really nice stereo, like reverb pedal, like the, the cap of stand. It was really nice to get some of the uh, eerier effects that we we're doing. But I do believe kids, if you can't play it clean, don't play it with a pedal, right? Right. <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm kidding. But do honestly, honestly like every song I ever wrote with distortion in mind, I always mm-hmm. wrote on an acoustic. Yeah, that's where it starts. On, my, on a janky, yeah. like I purposely played on the yeah. cheapest, jankiest acoustic I have because if I could get it to, if I could be happy yeah. there, then I knew when I get that, <clears throat> I was going to be very happy. For sure. Um, For sure. And, and not only that, it's just easier to pick up an acoustic than it is to plug in your whole rig. But... <laughs> But yeah. um, right on. Um, do you just sing out of whatever mic they give you, or do you have uh, the band? Like we have some Shures, like you know the the run of the line live fifty eight or... Shures, the SM fifty eight. Yeah, is that it? Yeah, yeah we got a couple of those yeah. that yeah, we those do. Are solid. We have a practice. Um, I'm a real big fan of Rode microphones when it comes to the studio. For me, that's another big bang for the buck type thing. I have a tube. Uh, I have a tube road mic that I use for the acoustic recordings in Miles NDP. It was just me and the acoustic and that mic, basically. We went right on. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a gearhead. I like collecting all sorts of different stuff, trial and error, and nice. seeing what works. All right. Uh, from from talking about the gear you currently have, let's talk dream gear. Is there any dream gear you're just like lusting after? Any of that Wayne's World, you know, oh, someday yeah. you'll be mine. Oh, yeah. And we're going to start with him. Okay. Start with the drums. Get that out of the way. <laughs> Well, I'm actually a big fan of SJC custom drums. Um, Stick with the custom theme. Yeah, here. <laughs> um, I'm not. I'm just. I don't know. I, I like you know DW. You know, I appreciate them, and I'm just not a big fan of you know the the production drums. You know that they're just pumping yeah. out, pumping out, pumping out. I mean, out. when you get to a certain size, there is a certain thing that's lost. Yeah, it's the same with you know guitars and with 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 anything really, yeah. food even. So seems like so. I have. An idea for my custom drum set that I want them to do for me, but they have one that they built, and it was actually for uh, the drummer for We the Kings, and it was for one of the Warp tours. And I just, I really wish I see it go on eBay because I don't care how much it is, I will <laughs> buy it. Um, they made it look like the DeLorean from Back to the Future. Get out. Yeah, no, it was it was sick. And basically, they had they had the flux capacitor on the floor tom, and like it was just it's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna I'll, have to. I'll have okay. to show you it. I'm gonna put a picture here because <laughs> I'm trying to picture a DeLorean from Back to the Future as a drum set. Yeah, right? yeah. And yeah, they're just as far as like custom drum kids go and, and off the wall kind of stuff. They are the company that does it. Like I, they've done a hamburger kit. Yeah. <laughs> Ninja Turtles. Ninja Turtles. Yeah. Well, of course, uh, on the, on the did, half shot. Yeah, they yeah. did. They did a. They did a Slimer Green acrylic kit. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah they put a lot of that creative. Yeah. You know, 
and they did a lot of stuff, you know, for like, it was a lot, you know, like they started, you know, back in the day, you know, going to Warped Tours and just getting, talking to the bands there and going, hey, you want to like rock our, rock our shit? Well, yeah, I mean, why not? And they kind of went from there and just some of the kits that they built over the years, they're just, they're definitely masters of their craft. And, right on. Uh, yeah, Dream Kit would be one of theirs for sure. And how does it compare to a, to a, one of yours? Uh, probably tenfold. <laughs> Mine, mine's good it, it's, it was a labor of love I, it sounds great it, it's beautiful um, but like I said I just kind of want to put that in the closet and, and, yeah. a show pony yeah. uh, it's a, what's a, a trailer queen That's... Yeah, I actually have I have. An, I want to I want to make a drum room at my house I just don't have it yet um, I mean we all want the music room right so yeah I would love to just have that one just kind of set up and it just kind of sits there and looks pretty right yeah. alright dream gear <laughs> Um, there is a head that runs about four to five grand even used. It's diesel or Dysel? Uh, Dysel, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This, this was used in one of my favorite bands, uh, like one of my favorite albums by them, Alkaline Trio, Good Morning, uh, and a couple others that use the diesel head. I, I don't know. It, it's, I haven't really experienced it, but it's one of those like dream, like trophy, like heads, like I just want my collection. Right. Um, but from what I've seen, what I've heard, what I've watched, like it's a badass freaking head. Um, guitar wise, I think I'm pretty much there. Um, I've spent a lot of money. <laughs> um, but you know, I'd probably, I mean, I'd, I'd probably have a lot more guitars, you know, obviously if I could, you know, I'd probably have some more like Gibsons and stuff like that. Like I'm more of a Fender guy and even for bass, I, I have a 60s jazz, uh, that I have, which is great guitar. I broke the bridge today <laughs> at practice. It was jerk. And I'm really sad. Uh, so maybe like a, a really high end like music man, like Ernie Ball music man, Stingray, like bass, ooh, like that nice. would be really cool. Um, but yeah, as far as everything else, I mean, like I feel like nowadays you can just mic a good amp like the Twin Reverb and, well, and get some. The good thing is with the, the as far as recording goes, anyway, the emulators that they have and the pet with plugins, you can make any like a two hundred dollar guitar sound. Like anything, if you got a good, if you got a good ear, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, just it's it's amazing. But as far as actually having the gear, that's a good choice. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, I mean, like we we use some software for the recording. You know, it wasn't all mic to amps for the most part. Um, but even that kind of got muddy. So I kind of really dove in, and kind of learned my lesson on on some of the other hardware and stuff that we use for the production of of the album to get like really true tones. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of escape that muddy sound, which we use a lot of plugins, I think, for the earlier stuff, like Cantina. Yeah. And you can tell the difference between the muddy and, and, and the clear separation that's in the new album. Um, I listened to a little bit of each of the songs from the um, Miles, Miles End. Miles End. Mm -hmm. And I definitely heard different sounds. And I was wondering, it's like, is that actually gear? Or is that just, uh, you know, on the like in post, we, we, we changed the, the sound? Right. Um, so Cantina, the thing that I think we're probably the most proud of with that song, or at least I am, is that that was like my first go at recording and producing myself. Oh, so well, I spent, did. I probably spent way too long on that song <laughs> and I should have, but like everything was done in our living room with that. Um, I mean, we even had David come in, we're like miking different snares and doing like different like things and then, you know, different plugins and stuff like that. So that was, that was the best that we could kind of get at that point. Uh, musically on 86 me the next track was still us but then I went to a friend vocally in uh, Florida who we used for uh, uh, playlist for purgatory because I just trust him and uh, he did a really banger job this time around I can't wait for you guys to hear it um, Stay tuned. But, but it's all been uh, like a learning experience I, I think yeah I've learned the most about being a musician by being in the studio Okay, because you can get away with some stuff playing live, especially when people don't know what what it's right, supposed to sound right. like. Yeah, you can get away with stuff, and the band just looks at each other and like, okay, well, I guess we're doing <laughs> it that way now. But in the studio, because you you don't you never do one take in the studio, not ever, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> well, <laughs> for the most part, I mean, the let me rephrase part. it. The ideal <laughs> is one yeah, take. No, yeah, it was, it, but yeah. you end up spending a lot of time just. I can do better. I can do better. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I spent weeks finding the right sounds, so I mean, that's yeah. basically like takes. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, moving from the from the highs of dream gear to the lows of losing gear. Oh. Uh, we're, we're almost done. We got a couple questions left. You, you ever lose any gear? Oh man. 
Tell us the what story. Um, me, I haven't really lost anything. I've sold stuff that I've regretted <laughs> selling. But you haven't forgotten anything? But I, have, I've never, I mean, drums are kind of hard to forget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never actually forgot anything or lost anything. I've had some things stolen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. suck. Yeah, but it wasn't... They were all, like, kind of cheesy stuff anyways. Um, but, yeah, no, I've never... Were you just like, why did they steal that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, yeah, it was, it was my just crappy squire. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but other than that, yeah, no, I haven't really lost her. How about you? For me, it was my fault, and this is why it stings, I think, the most. Was alcohol involved? It, no, no. I was actually really young. It was my first, like, big time guitar that my dad had bought for me. My dad didn't have a lot of money, so it was even... And he still talks about it to this day, and it breaks my heart when he brings it up. Oh, man. Um, but, Twist the knife, Dad. So, yeah, outside of my pawn shop, you know, guitars, he bought me, I believe it was a 2002, 2001... American Fender Fat Strat Texas Special with two Seymour Duncan humbuckers. So it was the HH, and it was in like a spackled aquatic green with like a diamond uh, looking esque uh, like Fred uh, or pick guard. And it was a really expensive guitar. And it was my first like major like American type Fender guitar outside of like Squire or whatever. And a couple years, I was probably like. 20 or 21 i was in a really hard place i was out in florida trying to do the band thing and i was just a front man singing at that time mm -hmm. and i was like hard up for rent and it like broke my heart but i pawned it Better and that. I, I, oh. I convinced myself i'd get it back and i didn't yep. um so i've been like chasing that guitar i think for years <sighs> after i did that my dad was like so broken hearted about it like yeah. Yeah, like, he's really disappointed about that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I tried showing him my new HH, uh, <laughs> but uh, it doesn't doesn't really cut it. Uh, that was a sick yeah. guitar, and I didn't realize at the time how unique that it really was and how much I really loved it, and, uh, you know, shame on me. But, yeah, that would be my big loss, because I've, I've been on Reverb. I've seen similar models. I even think, like, I found the exact one at one time coming out of Florida it was selling, and I was uh -huh. like, that's got to be it. And they wanted, like, double what I think the original retail was on it just because of how unique that it was. Yeah. But, um, whoops. You ever hear of a, Sorry, Dad. <laughs> you ever hear of a brand called Tysco? Tysco. Big in the 60s, mostly. Um, I had a Tysco Del Rey. Literally, no two Tyscos were ever made the same. Some would have switches, some would have knobs, some would have switches okay. and knobs. And I remember I, I used to work at a pawn shop, coincidentally. I opened the case because this was going to go out for sale. And I remember thinking, what is that? And it had a whammy bar that started out like this and ended up like this. Just a big old thing. And like it it just begged you to grab and go, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> and it was all like gears and a huge spring. For the tremolo, it was all very, like, engineering type thing. And it was a zero nut, my first ever zero nut. And I, and I talked my, my manager at the time into, you know, a good deal. And I bought it. And I left it in the parking lot at Hooters Casino after a battle of the bands. Not even a paid gig. Oh, man. <laughs> and I left it and I got home and I, I really did that, didn't I? Of course, no one turned it in. Yeah. Couldn't find it. Oh, no, yeah. And, I mean, the thing is, like, up in room six, the guitar wall, no guitar is over 200 bucks. I've said this before. Because I know me, <laughs> and I know the places I play. So um, that guitar, even now, retails for like, you know, on eBay, 165 bucks. So it wasn't money, but it was yeah. this thing. It, it had a it had a, a pick guard that was stripes of texture, mirror finish texture. Yeah. So it was, it reflected the light. It was really cool. It was green, which apparently this model usually came in red. The green was rare. Okay. And you just learn about it. You're like, oh, this is really cool. I'm glad I have this. Yeah. And then you're an idiot. So <laughs> that's my uh, lost, lost gear story. I'll say this. Like my word of advice on guitars is obviously like when you're young, you're starting out, you don't have money. You know, you do with what you can and what you can find. But if you can swing the guitar you really want, it's so worth it to like go and get that guitar than it is to like throw away 300 here, mm -hmm. 500 here. You know, you end up with all these guitars that you're not in love with. Like, yeah. buy the guitar that you're in love with, and it, it really, for me personally, it really goes places. Like, when I love my instrument, and I just really... That's actually really good. With it. That's a good piece of advice, uh, because I I thought I found another Tysco online. Turned out to be 
<laughs> it was, uh, turned out to be a, uh, it was like a like I also had I own my very first electric guitar was a Fender Strat Squire Bullet. So it went bing 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 bing. Okay. With every word you're going shorter, shorter, shorter. Ninety nine bucks guitar center, you know. Yeah. 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 You do it, and and to be honest, a lot of recordings I've done have been on that guitar with with pedals, you know. Yeah. And and, and it's when you're playing a four hour set, a four hour show of covers, lighter is better. Yeah. You don't play a Gretsch. <laughs> yeah, no, I had, I had a really cool uh, Squire Fender bass that we sanded down and like easily could have put like a Seymour Duncan, you know, upgraded yeah. it for you know yeah. a minute amount compared to what it'd be to like throw in a full American. But you know, that's the thing. I always kind of wished I had went and spent some money and improved the guitar bodies I had yeah. with better things. But it never was like there was never a need. Was more of a want and life and baby and you know, right. blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, and now I don't do shows. I do this. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually at one point recently had somebody kind of hinting around about maybe band thing and and and, and I asked my wife and kid and they're like, no, you you do enough. You do too much with <laughs> no. this as it is. Yeah. Don't add a band to it because they know they've been down the road where uh, it is I, hard. Two in the morning. Dad it's... comes home two in the morning. Gotta work at eight, you know. It's, it's really friggin' hard, and yeah. like that's. But I think that's what really like, not knocking your situation or, or anything, like not even comparing it. But I think for me personally, it was like the test, right? Mm -hmm. It was like I'm working these fourteen hour days. I'm a truck driver. I'm driving up the mountains. I'm doing this and that, and like that became my career for you know over ten years. And to like dive back into it and like just add it on to addition, it was like, well, if I can pull this off, then I must really like it. Right, you know what I mean. Then I wasn't fooling myself. It wasn't a uh, a phase. It was definitely a burning desire. And I think whatever that burning desire is in your life, you need to follow that and find that. I think that's the meaning of life. If there is any, it's it's uh, follow your burning desire because yeah. you really can't go wrong. Whatever I think, it is. I think uh, before we get on to the last question, thanks for sticking with us. By the way, yeah, uh, I know this has been a long one. Uh, There, it's okay if you decide, you know what, I just want to make music. I, or maybe I, I just want to be, you know, I just want to record my stuff and get it out there. I don't need, I don't care about playing shows. That's cool. Or I really want to play shows, but I don't care about, you know, going in the studio. That's fine. Music should be whatever it is that you want to do. Going back to the gatekeeping that we're talking about. Don't gatekeep yourself. Do what you want to do with it. Um, and with that, last question. You made it. We did it. Yes. We did it. Cheers. Yes, cheers. I want to thank you guys. Boom suits. I don't have anything anymore. You have actually, you don't have anything. What the hell? <laughs> I got a crap services table. I know. Uh, inside joke for the new record, uh, Jim Beam is one of my favorites. Huh, so well, there you look know. out for that song. Well, yeah. Thanks, father-in-law, for getting a Jim Beam. Hey. hey thumbs up. <laughs> Let's pretend... You're in a show. Okay. Killer set. Some some young kid comes up and says, how do I be like you? What is one piece of musical advice that you wish somebody had given you when you were starting out? Be better than me. <laughs> <laughs> and Learn from my mistakes. <laughs> no, like uh, chase it from the beginning. Do what you can. Um, you can work hard. You can have a regular job. You can have a family. You can have music. You can do whatever you want to do. Like... You can make the time, you know, it kills me, honestly, you know, having the jobs that I had, like doing what I did, but still making time for people that I cared about. If you really want to, you can. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's the God honest truth. And like, whatever it is, with, if it's makeup artist or, or, you know, podcaster, illustrator, you know, whatever, you know, whether you're in a sports or whatever it is. Just find that burning desire. Don't let anybody tell you no. And if you want something bad enough, you can get it. I, I believe. I agree. Even if I haven't reached all my goals, I just, I think the road is still better than the end sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think just like having that belief system and uh, working hard and, and following that artistically, whether who listens or who doesn't or, or whatever, or any of that political stuff or what you wear at a show, um, be happy and, you know, be better than your idols. Yes. They always say, don't meet your heroes. Yeah. yeah. It's tr I've met some of my I've heroes. met some. I'm like, oh, you fucking asshole. Well, <laughs> or even just that. You're just like, oh, you're you're just like me. Yeah. You're just a person. You're just a yeah. person. Yeah, which is good, though, too. It's, it's it it is. To see that. 
uh, doing this channel has taught me so much about that in that I get people in here every now and then that I'm just like, I can't believe you're on the show, I can't believe you're on the show. And they're, they're totally just low-key stressing out about it. And I'm like, it's, it's, not, it's not that big a deal. <laughs> it's okay. Like having to just, you know, kind of ease people in who you see them on stage. They're the picture of confidence. It, it, we're all just trying to figure it out. We're all just trying to figure it out. Yeah. yeah. You know, just don't make it worse and and do what you can to make yourself happy. Yeah. That's yeah. pretty much it. How about you, Dave? You prefer um, David or Dave? Either. Either. Or, okay. Yeah. Either. How about you? <laughs> nice. Hey, <laughs> like, guy. Uh, <laughs> I'm here all week. Hey. Um, kind of going back to what we talked about earlier, is, you know, uh, especially at today's day and age. I mean, back when we first started out, we didn't have YouTube and all that. So right. my day lessons. <laughs> Don't give away the age, but yeah, yeah, you know, lessons. I, I'm a firm believer in, in getting lessons. I wish I would have actually did more with lessons. Me too, yeah. I, I learned a lot in high school. Um, I had a great band teacher, uh, Mr. Farr. He's a good dude. Uh, he taught me a lot, and then I had another uh, teacher outside of that. I only did a few uh, lessons with him, but it's a lot harder to unlearn bad ha bad habits than it is to learn the correct way to do things. Yeah. Um, and there's certain certain techniques that you need, you know, to do it correct, you know, and just have an easier way, you know, an easier time in learning an instrument mm -hmm. than just trying to willy-nilly it. I mean, obviously you can do it. I did it, you know. Uh, <laughs> but lessons. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And, and one, more, one more thing before we sign off. Please tell um, me. I think a hard part too, like for me and probably a lot of you like watching is sometimes your biggest critics are the people closest to you. Oh yeah. And I just encourage you to still follow your heart and find a way to still love and respect those people as much as you can. Uh, you know, for me, it wasn't always easy growing up and, and just constantly having the people the closest in my life and had the most control it felt over my life saying, don't quit your day job. You know, you never do this or whatever. And, you know, that's not what it's about. Like definitely follow your heart because you only have one life to live. And, you know, I don't know the answers to everything. I don't know the answers to life or the universe or God or heaven or hell or any of that stuff. But I can say this, as far as I know, this is, this is a once around thing for, for this body at least. So do what you can to follow your heart and follow your dreams. Um, and just keep loving your heart and try to be understanding that, you know, those critiques probably come from a place of, of failure themselves. So uh, with love, you know, I say that. <clears throat> yeah, I got nothing else to add to that. Um, I will say, congrats on being, I think, the longest interview I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> you beat Crimson Riot. They held the you record about an hour and a half. Couldn't shut me up. And we didn't even have a performance yet. <laughs> Speaking of which. Yeah, which... I've had enough Jim Beam, I think I'll do it regardless. <laughs> really? You want to you wanna jump up and do a couple I'll, I'll songs? I'll do it, I'll do it. Yeah. We're going to see them up in room six, so stick around. Um... In the meantime, thank you for being amazing. We'll see you upstairs. And uh, yeah, temporarily, bye. We're White in the Ashes. This song is 86 Me. And they go something like this.
Hey, we're White and the Ashes, and this is a little uh, two-man jam of our song, Purgatory Boy, which is on Purgatory for Playlist Part 1, coming out June 26th. Yeah. 26th? 27th. Oh, <laughs> Whenever. Happy for dropping by. It was a great interview and a great performance. If you want to know more about them, please click the link down below. Don't forget to keep an eye out on their social media for their new album called Playlist for Purgatory Part 1. Come on. Part 1. Part 1. Um, in the meantime, if you want to, you know, get some cool merch, room6.shop. If you want to support the channel, there's links down there as well for a Patreon page and other places. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this, please click up here. If you want to subscribe to the channel, really appreciate it and it really does make a difference, please click down here and don't forget to ring the bell. Remember to be amazing, and we'll see you next time on Room 6. Say bye, guys. Bye. See you later. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba.